Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahibi ajma'in. Amma abad. A'udhu billahi minu shaytani rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa man ahsan nukala mimman dhu ila Allahi wa amilu salihau. Wa qala inna nimla muslimin. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa salli amri. Wa halul ugdatum milisani yafka wa kawli. I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla, the Peace TV Chinese, as well as the viewers on my Facebook, which are the viewers on my social media, including the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, and Twitter. I welcome all the viewers with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. I welcome you to this program, Ask Dr. Zakir, Season 12, Session 1. Here you are most welcome to ask any question on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have asked you and you are unable to reply or what you find in the media. This is the opportunity. The best is that you can ask questions on any of my social media platform, but the best would be to ask as a text message on the WhatsApp mentioning your name, your profession, your city and country of origin, along with the question in brief to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. I repeat, plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. Before we take the questions from the WhatsApp, it's my duty that we should pray for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. And I remember the last session that I handled, that is season 12, uh, season 11, session 7, there was a question that why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not giving victory to the people of Palestine? And I gave a long answer. It was close to one hour. The reason is and the logic and the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And recently, I heard a clip of the president of the Islamic organizations in Europe. And you're saying that before, last year, before the war of Israel and Palestine started, approximately 80 people used to convert every day. But since the war started, the conversion rate, people accepting Islam in Europe alone, has increased to more than 400. And he said that in France alone, in one country alone, in a span of two and a half months, this was a couple of weeks earlier, in a span of two and a half months alone, more than 20,000 non-Muslims in France, they accepted Islam only after watching the clips of the atrocities that the Israeli army is putting on the Gaza. That is, the Israeli army is killing the people of Palestine in Gaza. Only because of this, young girls and boys, even below the age of 18, if they have to give shahada, they have to come along with their parents. And their parents are willingly coming and asking the Muslims to take the shahada of these. And he put the figure of more than 20,000. And we know that in the last three months, more than 22,000 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza by the Israeli forces. And this similar number, only in France, a similar number of non-Muslims, only in France except Islam. I have no way of verifying this figure, so I cannot vouch for this number, but we know. I myself have seen, and you may have seen, hundreds of clips of non-Muslims, of the Westerners, of the other non-Muslims, giving shahada only after watching the clips of Gaza. Watching, watching the atrocities that the Israelis are putting on the Muslims of Palestine. And they are shocked that how come these people, even after their family members have been killed, even they have been tortured, they are injured, yet they are praising God. Which God are they worshipping? Many of them starting in the Quran. And because of this, leave aside what is said by the head of the organization, of the European organization, we can easily put a figure of more than 22,000 people all over the world have accepted Islam only because of watching of the clips in Gaza. 
So, the more number that they are killing, Alhamdulillah, all these people are martyrs. And inshallah, they will go to the Firdos. But a bigger number all over the world are accepting Islam. So, I have no way of verifying what this president of the European organization has said, but surely all over the world, there are tens of thousands of people except Islam. And we can say that there are tens of millions of non-Muslims who have come closer to Islam. We see the protests, not only in the Muslim countries, in the non-Muslim countries, in USA, in countries of Europe, in large numbers, in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions. They are supporting the cause of Palestine and they are saying free Palestine. You have celebrities, so much so that when people started watching the clips of Gaza, Facebook has its own algorithms and immediately you have other clips coming. So much so that it was that Facebook was promoting Islam. So now what they have done, we just got a report a couple of weeks back, they have changed the algorithms and they are trying to avoid people watching the clips of Gaza. Because the way it is built, if you see something, you have similar videos coming. So because of that, those people are influencers and they are making clips on Gaza and supporting the cause of Palestine. Immediately people start watching their, uh, uh, their videos and the views are going in millions. So Facebook deliberately they have changed their algorithms so that Facebook doesn't promote Palestine. So this is from Allah. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter number 3 verse number 54, Allah says, Makru makrullah wa Allah makreen. They plan and plot it. Allah to plan. Allah is the best of planner. We pray for the Muslims, the brothers and sisters of Palestine, that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them sabr, may Allah give them strength, may Allah give Janita Firdos to the martyrs. And we are learning from you what is Islam. The, our Iman is increasing watching the videos that even after so many so much of atrocities that you're saying alhamdulillah you're praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and every day in our salah we are reading after the in every farda salah in the last rakat we are praying we are read, reading the dua qunut the nuzul qunut and we are praying for the brothers and sisters in palestine and inshallah inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you victory in this world and the akhirah Inshallah, now we'll take the first question from the WhatsApp. <clears throat> the first question from WhatsApp is from Osama Nazir, profession, student of Punjab University. City Jhelum, country Pakistan. How to do dawah without hurting the feelings of others? If someone is a Muslim and doing something which is prohibited in Islam, then how can we correct him or her? This is a very good question asked by Osama that how can we da how can we do dawah to others, to non-Muslims as well as Muslims without hurting them? Before I give the reply, let me tell you that there is a misconception amongst the Muslim Ummah that most of the Muslims think that when you do dawa, it is compulsory that while doing dawa, you should not hurt the person on whom you are doing dawa. This is a misconception. And one of the most important verses for dawa, which is given in the Quran, which Allah gives us guidance, is in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125. Where Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bilikma, wal ma'azit hasna, vajadun bilati ahasan. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with the wisdom and beautiful preaching, with the wisdom and beautiful preaching, and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Almost all the Dais, they know this verse. And they say, this is the guidelines for doing dawah. And many a times, when I go to give talks amongst the non Muslims, the organizers will come and whisper in my ear, Sheikh Zakir, speak with hikmah. You know, speak with hikmah. Trying to tell me that go soft. You know, be kind, don't hurt the non-Muslims. This verse of the Quran of Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, most of the Muslims do not know the context. Yes, the verse is very clear. 
that invite all to the way of thy Lord with the wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best most gracious. So most of the Muslims think wisdom means you have to be soft, you don't have to hurt the person you're giving dawah to and you should be humble. If you see the context of this verse and if you read Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 20 onwards, it says five verses before Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 125 from verse number 120 it says that in Prophet Abraham is a beautiful example. He was a model and he was on Tawheed. The Quran says he was not amongst those who associated partners with Allah. And there was continuous that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him the best in this world and will also reward him in the Akhirah. And there was continue. And it says in verse number 123 that, that O Prophet, referring to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we have given the religion of Abraham that you worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the verse continue and then it says Udu ila sabili rabbika blikma invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and brief preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best most gracious so in context this verse is saying that Prophet Abraham is an example and we know when we refer to the other verses of the Quran that what did Abraham and Salam do? There was a time once to convey the message to do dawah, he broke the idols. And the mushriks were so angry, they said, Who did this? Then they said, There's a boy by the name of Abraham. And they catch him and they ask him, Who broke it? He broke all the idols except the big one. So he told, Why don't you ask this big idol? He will tell you who broke the other idols. So they said that you know very well Ibrahim that the idol cannot speak. So he says that when you know the idol cannot speak and yet you worship the person, yet you worship the idol who cannot speak and cannot protect himself. So you know from context that here Hikmah was breaking the idols. Of course, that's not to be done always. So Hikmah means wisdom. Wisdom means doing the right thing at the right time. I do agree that most of the time while doing dawah you should be soft, you should be kind, you should be humble but that doesn't mean only being humble is correct, only being soft is correct. Sometimes you have to be firm. Many a times a father is cruel to be kind. If his son wants to jump from the 10 story building saying I am a superman and if the father tells nicely to his son do not jump, he may have to slap him. So that he doesn't jump. So similarly in Dawa, depending upon the situation, I do agree most of the time you have to be soft, you have to be humble, you have to be kind. But sometime in a debate, when you're debating, you should be tough. So depending upon the situation, so please get this right that it's not necessary that while doing Dawa, you should never hurt the person who you're giving the message to. Sometimes to deliver the message, Hurting may be the best. And that's what Ibrahim al -Salam did. Not always, but in that situation. To prove his point, he had to do that. Now coming to your question. That if a Muslim is doing something which is haram, how will we correct him without hurting him? Now this comes into Islam. Islam means conveying a message to a Muslim. The word Islam means to repair, to improve. When you're making a Muslim a better Muslim, it's called Isla. And Dawa is the more appropriate word used when you're speaking to non-Muslims, calling the non-Muslims towards Islam. But both these words are interchangeable. Both these words are interchangeable. This reminds me of Hadith of the grandsons of Prophet, Hussein Hassan Mallah repeated them, that once when they see an elderly man who was not performing wudu correctly, so they don't go and tell him that the wudu you are doing is wrong. They tell him that please can you observe both of us that which amongst us is doing wudu properly. And they both, they start performing wudu. So the old man, when he sees these young children performing wudu, he realizes that the way he was performing wudu is wrong. So this was hikmah of Hussein and Hassan, may Allah be pleased with them, that 
they corrected the elderly man being young children with hikmah. So, depending how, depending on the situation, the hikmah demands how well do you correct. So, depending upon the situation, you may have to be soft, sometimes you have to be tough, sometimes you have to be kind, sometimes you have to be rough. But most of the time, a dai should be soft, should be humble. It is more important to win over the enemies than to defeat them. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusila chapter 40 and verse number 34, that repel evil with good. You may never know the person who is your enemy, he'll become your friend. So these are the rules of Dawah. And how you do it? It is hikmah. That when you see something wrong being done, you don't just snap at the person. Don't just bombard and tell him that you're doing haram, you're doing wrong. It will put him off. So how well do you correct him? How well do you do? I gave you an example of the grandsons of the Prophet. So in this way, the more important thing is that you have to deliver the message. Same thing when we speak to a Christian, giving the message. How do we start? How do we break the ice? We and I always say that Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And one of the beautiful rules and master key of Dawah, Allah says in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, it says that, Kuli Hal Kitab, say O people of the book, say O people of the book, Ta'alo ila kalimatin sawa im bainan bainakum, come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bin shayyam. That we associate no partners with him. Wala yattakhi zabad dun abad dun arabab dun minillah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and pit other than Allah. Fain tawallah. If then they turn back. Fakul shadu. Say bear witness. Be anna muslimoon. That we bear witness. That we are Muslims bowing all to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here one rule is, it is better to speak about the commonality than the differences. So when you see something wrong happening, first you talk about the commonalities. So when you see the Christian doing shirk, instead of directly pointing out the shirk, you come to the commonalities. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born by lepers with God's permission. So here, we are talking about commonality. And then we may come to it that, you know, why all are worshipping and so on and so forth. And you can see my lectures on this. So similarly, when we speak to Muslims and we find something wrong, you have to speak with hikmah. Oh, mashallah, you're a very good Muslim, I see you're doing this. And then you can come to the negative points rather than talk about the negative haram things he's doing. So this is hikmah, that when you see a Muslim doing something haram, you can first speak about the good things. Oh, mashallah, oh, you're a Muslim, I have a very good beard, mashallah, you know, may Allah give you this. And then you can do... Okay, why are you wearing towers below the ankle? You know what the Prophet also said that you have to wear towers of the ankle. So depending how well you speak, how well you speak with hikmah. But as I told in the start, hikmah doesn't always mean that you have to be soft. Sometimes you have to be tough. So hikmah means what is the best thing to be done at the right time. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> the next question <clears throat> my name is Basil Ali I am a student of intermediate part 2 I am from Sialkot, Pakistan my question is that if only one person is in the second or third saf and he prayed two or three rakat behind the imam. After the prayer ends, he should pray the rakat he missed or all the rakat because he is only one in the second half. A similar question is asked by another person, Munir Khan, a businessman uh, from Manchester, UK. If I enter a mosque for congregational farda salah 
and the first three rows are completely occupied, if I stand alone in the fourth row and no one joins me later, will my salah be valid or will I have to repeat the salah? As far as the ruling on if a person joins the congregational salah and if he stands alone in a row, the last row alone, will his salah be valid or will he have to repeat the salah? The opinion amongst the scholars is divided. According to Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik and Imam Shafi, these three ayamas, they say that if a person stands alone in a row for a valid reason or not for a valid reason, the salah is valid. The salah is not invalid. So if a person stands alone in the last row for, with a valid reason, or without a valid reason, the salah will be valid. This is the opinion. But according to uh, uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he says that if a person stands alone in the last row, in the congregation of salah, his salah is not valid. And the reasons given by the first three ayamahs, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam uh, Shafi, and Imam Malik, is that they say that when a woman is standing for congregation of salah along with men, and if she is a alone woman, she has to stand, she cannot stand with the men in the same row. So she stands behind alone and her salah is valid. So based on this dalil of the hadith, they say that even for the man, if a man stands alone, if a woman's salah is valid, if she stands alone in the last row, then how can you say that a man's salah is not valid? Based on this dalil, they say that the salah of a man in a congregation, in a mosque, even if he stands alone in the last row, with a valid reason or an invalid reason, it is accepted. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he gives the argument that here when a woman is standing alone, it is prohibited in the Sharia that a woman cannot stand in the same row as a man, that is the reason she is standing behind. So you cannot use this dalil for a man to say that his salah will be valid specifically because there is a clear cut hadith and it's a say hadith that the prophet said that a man who stands alone in the last row in the congregation of salah, his salah is invalid. So based on this hadith which is very clear cut in which the prophet said that if a man stands alone in a row in the congregation of salah, his salah is not valid. So Ahmed ibn Hanbal, may Allah uh, have mercy on him. He said this hadith is very clear cut. It's a sahih hadith. And based on this, the salah is not valid. So what should a person do? So if a person sees that there is space in the front rows, and if he stands behind, there is no difference of opinion in the humbly school of thought that the salah is not valid. You'll have to repeat the salah. But if in a situation, if a man comes and if the rows are completely filled, like the second question of Munir Khan, he says, I came to a mosque and the first three rows are completely filled. There was no space. I stood alone in the last row and no one joined me. And I complete my salah. Is my salah valid or not? So according to Imam Muhammad ibn Hanbal, that if there are two options that can be done, or rather three options, that if the rows are completely filled, one option can be that the person can go and stand next to the Imam. The second option can be he can tap a person in the last row and ask him to come behind so that he has two people in the last row, so everyone's salary will be valid. And the last option is he prays alone in the last row. As far as the first option is concerned, that if a person goes and stands next to the Imam, Surely it will, it will disturb the Imam. Secondly, the Prophet clearly said that in the congregation Salah, the Imam should be in the front. That is Mustahab. So unless there is no place to pray and someone goes, if the complete small Musalla or a small mosque is filled, and then if a person stands next to the Imam, it's fine. But if the mosque has space behind, why should it disturb the Imam? And why should you go against the Hadith of the Prophet that the Imam should be in the front? So the first option is not the correct option. Second option, if you tap someone from the last row and ask him to step behind, 
Number one, there will be a gap in the last row. And the Prophet said, they do not leave any gap. Stand shoulder to shoulder and feet to feet. Do not leave any gap for the Satan. So someone steps behind, there will be a gap. And if you close the gap, so the full row will be shifting and will disturb the full last row. Plus the, the additional point, the person who comes behind, you are degrading his position. From the third row, he is coming to the fourth row. And the Prophet said, the front row get more sawab than the back rows. So imagine you are tapping the person for your benefit, you are degrading the salah of somebody else. So the right opinion is that if the rows are completely filled and there is no option and you come later. So here you, you apply the ruling of the Prophet. The Prophet said, you follow Islam as much as you can. And now, if there is no way you can, you can join the last row because it's completely packed. So in this situation, if there is no other option, if you stand in the last row and you pray, your salah is valid. And if you see the arguments of all, all the various scholars, you agree that the view of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, that you should not pay a loan, unless there is no option. And if all the rows are filled up, then if you pray behind, then your salah is accepted. Otherwise, you will have to repeat the salah. So the opinion of Abu ibn Hanbal is more as per the ruling of the Quran and Sayyid. And it seems to be more correct. But even in this situation, if all the rows are completely filled, like the second question asks. So in this case, if you pray in the last row alone, the salah is valid. As far as the first question, that he prays only two or three rakat, he prays along with the imam, and maybe one or two rakat he has missed. So should he pray only the rakat which he has missed, or should he repeat all the rakat? If he is praying alone, single in the last row, when there is space in the second last row, then his salah is invalid, he should repeat the full salah. But if the last row is completely packed, and then he stands in a new row, and he gets three rakat, and misses one rakat, then he only repeats the one rakat which he has missed. Hope this answers the question. The next question. A student from Abbottabad, Pakistan. I have a question that if a person has committed many sins like that of zina at teenage, will Allah forgive him? And how will that person know that Allah has forgiven him? If many people have inappropriate videos of that person, will Allah protect his image, personal dignity in this world? The question posed by a student from Pakistan that if he had done zina in his teenage and later on he repents, so will Allah forgive him? How will he come to know that Allah has forgiven him? And if people have taken some videos and inappropriate things, how will Allah protect him from that? Number one, if you do any sin, especially if it's a major sin, then it's compulsory that you have to ask for forgiveness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you have to repent and there are five criteria for repentance when you repent for any major sin that you have done or any crime that you have done any sin you have done number one you have to agree it is wrong number two you have to stop it immediately number three not to do it in future number four ask for repentance and number five undo it if you can for example if you have stolen some good you have to give it back if you cannot undo it it's different but number one is agree it is wrong, number two stop it, number three don't do it in the future, number four ask for repentance. And fifth one is if you can undo, you undo it. So if you have done zina, which is a major sin, according to Imam al-Dhabi, it is the 11th major sin in Islam. So if you have done zina, and now that you have realized it is wrong, I'm sure you have repented, inshallah Allah will forgive you. Regarding question, how will you come to know whether Allah has accepted your forgiveness or not? If you repent sincerely, Inshallah, Allah will forgive you and that's the promise of Allah. There are various hadith. Allah says that all my servants who sin the full day and when they repent in the night, I forgive them. All my servants 
who sin the full night and when they repent in the morning I forgive them and there are various hadiths which the Prophet said that there is one hour during the last one third of the night where Allah descends to the lower heaven and he says that is anyone who like to ask anything and if you ask for forgiveness Allah will forgive you so and Allah promises Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48 and in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 116 that if Allah pleases he may forgive any sin but the sin of shirk he'll never forgive if Allah pleases he may forgive any sin but the sin of shirk he'll never forgive he will never forgive because the person who has committed shirk has gone far away he has committed a heinous crime so if Allah can forgive shirk which is the biggest sin if you ask for forgiveness so sin also he'll forgive the criteria for Allah accepting is that your sincerity and if you stop it Allah has accepted it if you ask for forgiveness if you are doing that sin and you stop it you don't do it again Allah has forgiven now regarding a third question that if someone has taken inappropriate videos of yours and makes it public how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will a sin be known to the people or not the general rule in Islam is that if you do a sin you should not publicize it if you have done a sin don't tell to others you repent you don't have to tell about the sin to others so best is you try and hide it but when you ask for forgiveness there are two types of forgiveness one one is called as maghfira that is Allah forgives your sin but your sin is written down in your deeds maghfira means Allah forgives your sin but your sin is written down in your deeds that you have done and on the day of judgment Allah will ask you about the sin you have done but Allah will not punish you that's called makrif that's called makfira the other is afu afu means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives your sin and does not even record that sin the sin which you have committed Allah completely erases it it is not mentioned in the records Allah will not question it about to you on the day of judgment and Allah has forgiven it and there are levels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not let other people also know about it so depending upon how well you repent it's possible for Allah that okay Allah forgives you yet your deeds will be known to others or Allah will question you on the day of judgment if you repent very sincerely and Allah if he does afford to you that they did in a beloved Prophet said that during Laylatul Qadr when Hazrat Aisha may Allah be pleased with her when she asked that what should she recite during Laylatul Qadr so the Prophet said even if you recite the dua that of asking Allah for forgiveness that means oh Allah you are the one to forgive you love to forgive so please forgive me if you repeat this dua the full night that itself is sufficient because you are asking Allah Oh Allah you are the one to forgive You love to forgive So please forgive me Allah ma inna kafuan So ibbul afwa afwaan So here the afwa that's mentioned here Is a higher level of forgiveness Where Allah forgives And erases The sign of your sin also So and Allah on a higher level Even hides it from the people of this world And even in the hereafter people don't come to know about it so we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he forgive our sins and may he do afwa that means he forgives and completely erases the record and may he grant us the firdos. The next question. Assalamu alaikum sir Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Myself Qasim Jafar I am a student I am from Assam India What is the minimum period of time To sell a share After purchase So that it will be halal Jazakallah khair Regarding the question that What is the minimum time period You can sell a shell You can sell a share after purchasing so that it is halal point number one when you buy from the stock market 
you should first identify that the shares you are buying is Sharia compliant. And this question was asked to me maybe a year back and I gave the reason and the answer is more than half an hour that there are five criteria that look into it before you buy a share of a company that the core activity should be Sharia compliant and the debt ratio should be less and various reasons. I don't want to repeat the full answer. But first you have to see to it that the share you are buying is Sharia compliant. It fulfills the criteria of Sharia compliance. Now once you buy Sharia compliant share, your main purpose is that you are a shareholder and you want to be part of the profit. So generally when you buy a share, you should not buy the share for speculation or gambling. Some people buy because okay now let's see the market goes up and immediately sell it and you may they buy the uh, shares in the morning, sell it in the evening, they buy this share today and sell it tomorrow. You don't open a company in the morning and shut it down in the evening. You don't open a company today and shut it down after two days. So when you're a shareholder, you are owner of the company. So you should not do speculation or, do not, or should not do something which is gambling. So that is prohibited. But there's no particular time period that is specified. But normally, when you want to open a company, it's a long term, you don't start a company for one day or for two days or for three days. So when you buy a share, you're looking at the profit for a long term, it's permissible, but you can't speculate or gamble, that is prohibited. But there can be a situation where you buy a Sharia compliant share and immediately get information, oh, what you have done is wrong, this company is going to go bust and you sell it the next hour. Okay, this is a rare case. You can't do that every company. So if you buy it and you sell it after one hour or sell it after two minutes, you buy it and you come to know that there's something wrong and you sell it, it's permitted. There's no fixed period. But if it's a logical reason that, okay, because you came to know that this company is going to go bust, which you did not know, and then you're selling, it's permitted. Or you buy a share and you come to know it is haram. Okay, this, this company you bought, it has been interest-based company and you sell it the next moment. Okay, that's also accepted. So if you sell it for a valid reason, there's no time limit for that. Whether you, you cannot sell it for five days or for one month or for six months, there's no time limit that is, that is specified. But generally, you can't buy and keep on selling the same day or few days, you know, that is called a speculation. But if it's for a valid reason, I've, as I mentioned, then you can sell it even after a minute, there is no issue if the reason is valid. Hope that answers the question. <coughs> you have on the Facebook, Muhammad Jewel, Muhammad Kamal, Muhammad Yasir, Ajmal Hussain, Urmatu Jima, Nayan Ahmed, Muhammad Abdul Hasib, Ayub Bhai, Khalid Ibrahim, Hassan Kazi. Most of them are saying Assalamu Alaikum and I wish back Walaikum Salam to you. Harun Rashid, Izad Din Giddi, Mahfuz Al Banna, Muhammad Nurul Islam Rasul, Sheikh Hassan, Muhammad Farhad Raihan, Irfan Jandaya, Alha Amak Dekit, Muhammad Shafiqul Islam, Muhammad Jahirul Islam, Junaid Khan, Noor Nobi Page, Ibn Nu Khan, um, most of them are doing duas for me and I, and I pray for you too. May Allah give you the best in this one and the Akhara. These were the people on the Facebook. You have many brothers and sisters on the YouTube. Commander Halal, INA Creativity, Muhammad Umar Sarfraz, Mukta Islam, Murtaza Khoshbin, Dr. Saklain Farooq, 
شانوی جمیل الرحمان فاروقی مشانت حسین محمد ذہاد حسن جمیل الرحمان فاروقی ساقب رضا محمد ٹی شیرین اختر طلا زبیر تنمئے من بھٹ محمد ذہاد حسن جیسے کہ السلام علیکم علیکم السلام درین دعا فرمی ہے پری فور یو ٹو There's a question asked from the YouTube by T. M. Mohsin. If Allah is the curer, why the probability of curing the pain by paracetamol, by paracetamol is so high? T. M. Mohsin is asking that if Allah is the curer, he is the one who gives shifa, so why is the probability of curing with paracetamol so high? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 43, and Surah Anbiya chapter number 21 verse number 7 First, Allah has a zikri in Gundala Talamun If you don't know, ask the person who is knowledgeable So when you ask the knowledgeable people, the doctors They say that when you have a headache or when you have pain You take paracetamol So because you are following the verse of the glorious Quran The probability of you taking a paracetamol And the pain getting cured is high Because you are following the guidance of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives shifa, who is shafi. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his own rules and regulations. Allah follows his own laws. Allah has his own law. When Allah is the one who can cure, he can cure even without paracetamol. Many a times you don't take and you get cured. But Allah has a rule to follow. He has his own laws. So when Allah is mentioned in the Quran, you ask the person who is expert, you ask the expert, and it's not always a guarantee that if you go to a doctor, you'll be cured. And you know that many a times you go to a doctor and your pain doesn't subside. He gives you a tablet, it doesn't subside. He gives you an injection, it doesn't subside. So final one who cures is Allah. But the zariya, the, the way, the path is which you choose. And even if you choose the wrong path, maybe Allah will let cure. Like Allah says, he... He gives many of the unbelievers rope to go to and fro. So the thing is Allah is testing you. That are you following the guidance of the Quran or not? So if you have pain, Allah is the one who gives shifa. He is the final one. But he will say, okay, fine. Do you follow the guidance? Do you go to a doctor? Or a doctor has told you that if you have a headache, you take a tablet, a paracetamol, or, or uh, a crocin, or... You may take Panadol or Panadol extra, you take it and you get cured. But it's not 100% guaranteed. That's the reason many a time the doctors say that we have done all we can, now only God can save you. So they know that science is limited, but yet there are miracles. The doctor has told that, fine, now you will not live for more than two weeks. And you find that years have passed and into your life. So the final one is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one to cure. But the zariya, the pathway, have you followed it or not, depends upon you. And yet, even if you disobey, many a times Allah gives you rope. Okay, let's see. You want this? I give you. You want money? Then we ask for money? I give you money. You want gold? I give you gold. The more you dig your own grave with it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 6 and verse number 2, Allah the khalaq al mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. So Allah is testing us, whether we follow or not. So the main cure is Allah and the pathway, it is the paracetamol. Hope that answers the question.
There's a question on the YouTube from Farah Farhar Wood. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am a new revert to Islam. How I can encourage my family to accept Islam too? I keep making dua, but, uh, but I wish as soon as possible they accept Islam. How, how can I convince them? Sister, giving hidayah is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can try, but giving hidayah is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What I request you is that now that you have accepted Islam and you said you are a new revert to Islam, my request to you is that see to it that you are more kind and more humble and more loving to your family members than what you were before. And see to it that you obey them, everything except what is against the teachings of Quran and Sunnah. For example, your mother wants you to wear a blue color dress. I don't like blue color. Now that I've accepted Islam, see to it that go and tell your mother, Mother, though I don't like blue color, you told me to wear, I'll start wearing. You may do things, you may go and love her mom, you may dab her, you may respect her, you may help her in the kitchen. So you should see to it that there is a difference. They should think, what has happened to my daughter? Just a few months back she was different, now she has changed. And you should make it a point that now that you are a Muslim, you are following Islam. And tell her that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. Go and love your father, your brothers, your sisters. So you make a marked difference between what you were before and what you are now. And you see to it that while being good to them, you convey the message of Tawheed. The oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They should ask you, how come you have changed? So they say, this is what our beloved Prophet Muhammad said. This is what Quran says. Give them a translation of the Quran. In the language they understand the best. Whether it be English, it be Hindi, it may be other language. And see to it that you can even give some of my mm, videos. And if your parents, I believe that the Hindus, if the Hindus, you can give them the cassette of similarities between Islam and Hinduism. If they're Christians, you can give them the video because that similarity between Islam and Christianity. And you can surely ask them to watch the videos and maybe if there are any queries, you can ask them to ask the query to you. You find the answer and convey to them. You see to it that there should be a marked difference in your behavior. Even if they're angry with you, even if they're rough with you, see to it that you don't retaliate. As I said earlier, answer in Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 34, that repel evil with good. They are not evil, they are your family members, but even if they are not good to you, you be to them multiple times better. And in this way, inshallah, when you see the difference that is there in your behavior, in your nature, in your relationship, inshallah, this should be one of the major factors that they accept the deen of Islam. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he make all your family members accept Islam and may he grant you the best in this world and the akhirah. There's a question asked by Shireen Akhtar on the YouTube. Please answer. I have a relative who needs money. Can I give zakat now and deduct the amount from the total zakat money when I calculate during Ramadan? Relative needs money now. They can't wait. The question posed by Sister Shireen is that if one of her relatives want money, can she give from the zakat money and deduct it during Ramadan? There's a misconception amongst many of the Muslims that zakat should only be given in the month of Ramadan. There is no hard and fast rule that zakat should be given only in the month of Ramadan. But most of the Muslims, and that's a good practice, they calculate the amount to be given. They have to take one particular day of the year. So since Ramadan is a blessed month, people normally calculate the zakat in one of the days. Some people calculate on the first of Ramadan, some people calculate 15th of Ramadan, some people cal calculate the last day of Ramadan. So pick up one day and calculate. But this is for your calculation. 
that doesn't mean you have to give in the month of Ramadan. You can give in any time of the day, but do not delay it. Yes, you can give in advance. So if your relative falls in the category of a person who can receive zakat, there are basically eight categories to whom you can give zakat. It's mentioned in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 60, that you can give your zakat to a fuqara, a poor person, to a masakin who's needy, to a person, Mawla Futul Qutlu, whose heart is coming close to Islam, can be amilun, a person who collects zakat, you can give it to a debtor, a person who's in debt, or you can give it to a rakab fleeing or slave, you can give it to a wayfarer, a person who's traveler, and to Ibn, Sab uh, <laughs> Ibn Sabil, a traveler, and a person who in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if your relative falls in, in, many, in any of these eight categories, he may be poor, you can give, he may be needy, or he may be in debt. So if he falls in any one of these categories, surely you can give, give zakat money. You don't have to wait till Ramadan. Zakat can be given in advance, it should not be delayed. So if you give your zakat now, and most of the rich people, they give charity throughout the year, the major portion may be in the month of Ramadan, but some people who are poor and less, they normally give everything in Ramadan. But you can give zakat in advance, there's no problem at all, but you should not delay. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum sir. Is it allowed in Islam to talk to a girl I like? Question posed by Haider Mohsin on the YouTube. Is it allowed in Islam to talk to a girl I like? The main reason regarding talking to girls in Islam is various, con various things are considered. Number one is your niya. First of all, talking unnecessary to a Naam is not permitted in Islam. Talking unnecessary to a Naam means a foreign, foreign no, who is opposite sex, who is not your Mehram, who if for a man who is not a sister or, or mother or auntie who is not a Mehram, unnecessary talking is not permitted. If you go to a college or if you are in a school or a university and if there is a valid reason where you have to talk or about certain subject or certain issue and if you do that with lowering your grace as is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 30 say to the believing man that he should lower his grace and guard his modesty so when you're talking to a girl if it's a valid reason you lower your grace and then you can talk but your question can I talk to a girl who I like so the, here there is a caveat put girl you like so the moment you say girl you like and you're talking so the niya is doubtful so my advice to you is don't talk to the girl you like if you know there's a girl who is virtuous etc you can go through the correct channel there's nothing like love before wedding there's no lbw in islam there's no love before wedding but if you find that there's a virtuous girl you know about whether it's in your college or university etc you can go through the right channels you can surely go and tell your family members and one of your lady family members, maybe your mother or a sister can very well go and talk to, to her parents or your father can go and talk to the parents. Right channel is there, there's nothing like love before wedding that you have to talk to her and, and come to know her better etc. When, when there is a proper meeting arranged that if really if they feel that okay the matter can be thought whether it's worth marrying or not, you can have a meeting with the marams along and then you can talk. So if you arrange it properly that the mehram is there of the girl and from your side and then if there are chances that okay they don't mind seeing the prospectus whether it's worth marrying you or not in that case you can very well talk but not talk to the girl you like alone or going to a movie theater or going for tea but with the right channels you tell the in your family members they go and talk to their family members a meeting is arranged and you talk that's accepted to know the girl better, whether she's virtuous or not, whether she's the right match or not. Talking is 
no problem at all. In fact, the Prophet recommended that before marrying, you see the girl so that know who you are marrying. But if you want to talk just to enjoy, just to have, you know, to make friends, etc., this is private in Islam. Hope that answers the question. The question posed from YouTube, Jamil, Jamilur Rahman Faruqi. My name is Jamil from Nuristan, Afghanistan. What are the hijab parts for men and women? What the question I want to ask is mainly what is the satar? What is the total hijab criteria? A six. And satar is one of the criteria. As far as the hijab is concerned, there are six criteria for hijab which are mentioned in the Quran and the Hadith. The first is the extent. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. The different opinion whether the knee is included or not. But it's better that you include the knee, that is safer. From the navel to the knee for the man. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. There are some scholars who say that even the face should be covered. So the extent is, is the first criteria. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be tight fitting. So for the man, from the navel to the knee, it should not be tight fitting. If you wear the tight t-shirt, no problem. But from the navel to the knee, it should not be tight. For the woman, as the complete body is there in the extent except the face and the wrist, the clothes she wears in the complete body should not be tight fitting, it should be loose. Number three, it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through. For the man, the towel that he is wearing from navel to the knee cannot be transparent, cannot be translucent. If he wears the transparent shirt, no problem. But for the woman, a complete body should be covered. So then she cannot wear transparent, whether it be on top or down, the full extent is there. The fourth, it should not be glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And the last is, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. Uh, you can't wear a cross because the sign of Christianity. You can't put a vermil on a tikka, which is a sign of Hinduism. So these are the six criteria for hijab. And the extent, as I mentioned, from the man from the navel to the bottom of the knee is preferable. And for the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. There are some scholars who say that even the face should be covered. Hope that answers the question. Another question from the YouTube, Murtada Khushbin. Hi. Assalamu alaikum. Is it mandatory for a Muslim man to force his woman to wear hijab? The question posed is that is it compulsory for a Muslim man to force his wife to wear hijab? He has mentioned woman. It can be wife, it can be daughter, anything. As far as the Islamic ruling is concerned, that it is fard for a woman that she should wear hijab. And I mentioned the kaitra of hijab earlier. So can he force? Yes, he can force. But naturally there are limits. The best is to educate your wife or your daughter that wearing hijab is fard. You can give her books, you can give the fatwas, you can quote the hadith, you can quote the Quranic verses. But if she doesn't agree, can you force? You can force to the extent that you are permitted. So if she is a daughter, you can tell, okay, fine, you better do hijab or I'll not give you pocket money or whether you whether you use emotional force or whether you use economic force. See to it that you can try a level best because it's a fard. So for a parent to see to it that if a child is doing something haram, the parent has a right to force. Similarly, as far as the husband is concerned, husband can force, but best is to do it with hikmah and or you can give ultimatum that this is I want my wife to do hijab, it's very important and you can try and convince, if not there are stages as the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 35 that warn her, then you stop sharing the bed, the various ways how Quran has you know given, the best is with hikmah that you convince the woman folk in your family. If not, yes, you can use economical pressure, you can use emotional pressure 
as long as you're trying to convince them to do something which is further. Next question from the WhatsApp. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam, rahmatullahi barakatuh. I am Sultana from Bangladesh, living in USA. I love you so much, sir, only for the sake of Allah. I have watched most of your lectures, alhamdulillah. I bought a house by taking a loan from Islamic UIF Corporation Bank. Now, all other Muslim friends say, it is also it also included riba conventional bank and islamic banks are the same if my bank is wrong then i have to sell my house please sir clarify my question the sister who hails from bangladesh and living in usa she took a loan from an islamic bank in usa Personally, I'm not aware of this bank. But many of our friends are saying that the Islamic bank and the conventional banks are the same. And, you know, even they are riba based. So she's worried that if it's true, then it is haram for her to take because she agrees that riba is haram. Now, let me tell you very clearly that many of the Muslims are not aware of the Islamic financial systems. They may not have studied the Islamic financial law. So, in the ignorance, they may say that there's nothing in Islamic bank, etc. Because they don't know. So, they're not the right people that you have to ask to. But there is something like Islamic bank. There are scholars of Islamic economics who have given the guidelines. So, but I'm aware that there are some banks which are fraud. So, but you cannot make a blanket rule that all the Islamic banks are, you know, same like Rabah and it's wrong. So, I disagree with this. But... The point to be noted is, yes, there are some few banks in the name of Islam, they are cheating the Muslim Ummah, they normally give riba, etc., but they say it is Islamic. So you as a person, as far as this particular bank is concerned, I have no knowledge, I have not done any survey on this bank, so I cannot comment on this bank. But generally, as a thumb rule, you have to first see who are the advisors, the Sharia advisors on that Islamic bank. Every Islamic bank has a Sharia board. So if on that Islamic bank there are reliable Islamic Sharia scholars, like Sheikh Taqi Usmani, if you have reliable Islamic Sharia scholars, then safely you can take loan, it will be halal. But if you don't know who they are, so you have to do a little bit of survey and the background check that who are these scholars, are they reliable scholars or are they just namesake? But generally, the ruling is that if you take from Islamic bank and if the bank is not following the Sharia, they are responsible, you are not responsible. Until it is very clear cut, evidently clear. But those Muslims who say all Islamic banks are riba based, they don't have knowledge of the Sharia. So please don't listen to them. But if you really go and do research of the scholars on Islamic Sharia, who are mainly scholars of Islamic finance, like Sheikh Taqi Usmani, like Sheikh Daud Bakar, you know, these people are well known. And if you check up with them, it carries away. Not with the person, a Muslim who is a layman. But I personally feel that generally it is best not to take loan from any bank. Conventional bank is haram. But avoid taking loan even from Islamic bank. Unless you are forced that you cannot survive without taking a loan, then instead of taking from a conventional bank, take from Islamic bank. Taking from a conventional bank, which is riba based, is totally haram. Don't take it under any circumstances. But my advice is not to take a loan at all. Whether for business or other reasons, best is a loan-free life. You can take a reason from your Muslim friends or relatives, etc. Avoid taking from a bank. But if you have to take and you have no choice, then it's better to take from Islamic bank. And inshallah, it's safe. And if the bank does something which is not Islamic, 
they will be responsible not to you. Hope that answers the question. The next question on the WhatsApp. I am Tanbin Firoz from Chittagong, Bangladesh. Why you want Farik Naik and your daughters to become Dai over studying medicine? Tanbin has asked a good question that why do you want Farik Naik, talking about my son, and my daughters to become Dai's instead of becoming doctors or taking up medicine. So generally, doctor is a good profession. It's a noble profession. And for the world, it is the best profession. You know, if you go and ask any of the people who are involved in the world affairs, the best profession today considered is of a doctor. But as far as Islam is concerned, who is our role model? The messengers are role model. And the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Was he a doctor? And the answer is no. What was he? He was a messenger of Allah. What was his main duty? Dawa. So all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were Daish. And when I met Sheikh Ahmad Didad, I was inspired by him. And after meeting him, I was in a medical college. I was studying in the second year of medical college. And it was the desire of my parents that I become a heart specialist. And when I met Sheikh Ahmed Didad, you know, even I wanted to become a doctor. And the reason I wanted to become a doctor because doctor is a noble profession. It saves life. You can do a lot of, uh, you can do a lot of work on base of humanity. You can treat the patient free. You can save their lives. It's a good profession. But when I met Sheikh Ahmed Didad, I realized that Dai is far superior than a doctor. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, the ayah I started the session with, Allah says, Woman asanu, qala mimman da'il Allahi wa amilu salihaum, wa qala inna nimna muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of the Lord? Works righteousness and says I'm a Muslim. So this verse of the Quran is very clear cut saying that the best profession for a Muslim is of a Dai. And all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were dais. So, that is the reason after I finished my medical college, I converted from a doctor of a body to a doctor of a soul. It was Shaykh Dindad who inspired me. And the same thing with my children. I want them to take up the best profession. For the worldly people who believe only in the world, for them being a doctor is the best to get respect, etc. But they fail to realize that if the and Zilla is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he, he gives you Izzat, He gives you fame, gives you respect, He gives you Zilla. So there's no one better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I wanted to become a doctor because of the noble profession. And my mother, she wanted me to become like, you know, uh, Chris Bernard, who hails from South Africa. He was the person who did the first heart transplant. So when I asked my mother, when I got inspired by Sheikh Ahmed Didat, while I was just finished my medical college, and I finished my MBBS, and I asked her that, would you want me to become like Sheikh Didat or like Chris Bernard? So she said both. And later on, when I got involved in the field of Dawah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, gave me success and people started liking my lectures. After a few years, when I asked my mother that, would you want me to become like Sheikh Didat or Dr. Chris Bernard, who was the first person who did heart transplant in a human being, so she told me I would sacrifice a thousand Chris Bernard for one Sheikh Didat. So now my case is such that, you know, my parents, because my father was a doctor, and he felt that, okay, doctor is the best profession, they wanted me to become that. And when I, be, when I started doing Dawah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me success, and they realized that, they willingly supported me. They say, you don't have to worry about your living, we'll take care of you, you continue your dawah. And my brother said the same, and my family members they said the same. And Alhamdulillah, Allah helped me when I started doing business. Allah saw to it that all the requirements were given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. So, we as parents, me and my wife, and our goal was common, that you know, 
we were Dais. I chose a life partner to be Dai. And for our children, but naturally we want the best profession. So that's the reason being a doctor is good. It's a noble profession, but nothing compared to a Dai. So the best profession for a Muslim is a Dai. And regarding fame, regarding Izza, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, we never became a Dai to become famous. We did to serve the religion, to spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah made us famous. Today, even if I had been the best doctor in the world, I doubt so many heads of state would have met me the way they meet me now. The people who come to hear my lectures, thousands of them, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, a million people. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not because I'm something great, I'm something intelligent, I'm a great guy. It is Allah who gives this. So when we think about ourselves that there are thousands of people more intelligent, millions of people more knowledgeable than me. Why do so many people come to listen? It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who puts love. It is Allah who puts love in the hearts of the people that they come to listen to me. So Allah was giving Izzat. We have met many heads of states. We have met so many personalities. Surely even if I had been the best doctor in the world, I doubt a best doctor meets so many heads of states who like to meet him. They invite us, etc. So it's Allah who gives Izzat. But we want our children to become Da'is to be successful in this world and the Akhirah. Not for becoming famous, not for earning money. It's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is the best. And that is the reason Allah says in the Quran, sorry, Imran chapter 3, verse 160. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is then, then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we want our children, our son, our daughters to become da'is because that is the best profession. That's the noble profession. And now we know that the last and final messenger of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After that no messengers will come. But the spreading of the deen continues. Allah is sufficient to spread his deen. But if he utilizes us, then we are grateful to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah doesn't require us to spread his deen, the rubbish that we are. Allah himself is sufficient. Allah is giving us an opportunity to do a profit job and to earn a profit reward. So that's the reason I want my children to become Da'is because Allah says in the Quran, doing Dawah, part-time Dawah is further than every Muslim, but Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse number 104, let there arise out of you a band of people who invite people to the truth and forbid them from doing wrong. These are the ones who shall attain felicity. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about full-time da'id. How are you full-time lawyers, full-time doctors, full-time businessmen? How many full-time da'id do we have? You can count them on your fingertips. What we have in a society that if your son or children fail once, twice, then you make them hafizul Quran. Why should we want the rejects of society to present the deen or become hafizul Quran? We should let our best people they should represent the deen. That's the reason I never wanted any of my children. Yes, I saw to it that they got the education which is required. All my three children, they passed A-levels from IGCSE. And I believe IGCSE, which is the Cambridge board, if you do A-levels, it is sufficient for a human being to have the worldly knowledge. Then you can specialize. So they did the bachelors, all my three children, bachelors in Islamic studies you know, my daughters and my son in, in Sharia. And then later on, now all three are doing masters. Inshallah, they will complete very soon. My son maybe in a month's time and my daughter in a few months' time. And inshallah, I want them to be PhDs, not doctor of medicine, doctor in the Islamic studies. And all three of them. But with all these studies, with all these degrees, main thing is Allah's help. You cannot become a Dai by having a degree of bachelor's or master's or PhD. <clears throat> but Allah's help is most important. So I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah help them. What we could not acquire in our life, like I don't know Arabic as a language, I thought to it that my children, all three of them, they learned Arabic at a young age and they know Arabic very well. 
I am not half of the Quran. I thought that all my three children are half of the Quran. So I would say that the upbringing, as far as the upbringing is concerned, the childhood is concerned, or till the teens, all three children of mine, they are thousands of times better than what I was when I was a child, or when I was in the teens. I started Dawah after I met Sheikh Ahmad Didad in 1987, I was at the age of 22 years. That's the time I started doing Dawah. MashaAllah, by the time they reached 22, they were Hafizul Quran in Arabic as a language that completed the bachelors, alhamdulillah. So, we want to see to it that what we felt was lacking in us, we are giving to our children and we want them to be die so that they are successful in this world and the akhirah. And that should be the aim of all the Muslims, that number one is success in the akhirah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that if you strive for this dunya, Allah gives you dunya but does not give you akhirah. But if you strive for akhirah, Allah gives you akhirah and dunya both. Hope that answers the question. <coughs> There's a question from Ifat Ara on the YouTube. I'm a Muslim, but I'm in a relationship with a Hindu boy. He is not ready to accept Islam, but he confirmed me that I can stay with Islam. The question posed by a Muslim girl that she is in a relationship with a Hindu boy, he is not ready to accept Islam, but he doesn't mind her remaining a Muslim. So the question is, is it permitted or not? Allah clearly mentioned in the glorious Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 221, that do not marry a mushrika until she believes. A Muslim woman, even if she is a bond woman, she is better than mushrika even if she allows you. And the verse continues. Do not marry a mushrik boy until he believes. A Muslim boy, even if he's a bondsman, even if he's a slave man, is much better than a mushrik boy, even if he allows you. That means even if you have the most handsome man in the world, maybe Richard Gere or, or maybe Shah Rukh Khan. Shah Rukh Khan, supposedly Muslim or Richard Gere. Maybe handsome like you know Richard Gere or maybe what of one of the Bollywoods or the, or the Hollywoods, Akshay Kumar, etc. But if you have a slave boy or a slave man who is a Muslim, the Quran says he is much better than a mushrik even if he allows you. He may be handsome, he may be the richest man, but a Muslim is far superior. So telling the woman that you cannot marry a mushrik boy until he believes. And telling to the male, do not marry a mushrika, an idolatress, until she believes. So for you to marry a Hindu boy is totally haram. The marriage is not valid and it is not permitted at all. Even if he allows you to be a Muslim, you know very well that a person who is a mushrika will go to hell. So how can you marry a man who is going to go to hell? And what will happen to the children? So there is no question at all. There is no iota of doubt that you cannot marry a non-Muslim at all until that non-Muslim agrees to accept Islam and practice Islam. Just for namesake also it's not correct. If you do plastic surgery, just, just say the shahada so that he accepts Islam and you marry and then your children will start going you know, to, to the church or temple. So sister, I would say this is an infatuation. See to it that you ask Allah for forgiveness. If you are in a relationship with this man, whatever it is, in depth or superficial, my request to you, my advice to you is see to it that you stop this relationship immediately, not from tomorrow, from today itself. Ask Allah for forgiveness and repent to Allah. You stop it, don't do it again, and see to it that you search for a good, pious Muslim boy. You stop the relationship at all, you search for a good Muslim, pious person. And the Prophet said that when you marry, you look for four things. One is beauty, the second is nobility, 
Third is wealth. The fourth is virtuous, deen. And the most important is virtuous, is deen, is the religion. So see to it that you search for a good life partner. Tell your parents, tell your, tell your parents, your father, your brother. And inshallah, they search for you for a good man. Get married as soon as possible. That's the best for you. Hope that answers the question. There's a question from the YouTube by Jarsin. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam. I can see that you wear a blazer and tie. As far as I know, this kind of clothes are from Western culture. So can it be worn? The question is that you've seen me wearing a blazer, a suit and a tie. And according to you, this is a Western culture clothes. So can you wear it? I just answered in the previous question the six criteria for hijab. And one of the criteria is you cannot wear clothes that which resemble of the non-Muslim. So coat and tie is not a sign of any religion. Yes, the Westerners wear more. So there's no hadith saying don't wear clothes of other culture. It says don't wear clothes of other religion. So you cannot wear a cross, because cross is a sign of Christianity. You can't wear a vermilion or a tikka, it's a sign of Hinduism. So you cannot wear those which are signs of other religion. But as far as culture is concerned, if that cultural cloth goes against the Sharia conway, for example, in the Western world, many people wear shorts. But in the Islamic Sharia, I said the satar is from the navel to the knee. So wearing short is haram. So you cannot wear shorts in the public, it's haram. But wearing a suit and a tie, it's mubah. Many people have a misconception that tie is a sign of cross. No way in the Bible it is mentioned that tie is a sign of cross. In fact, if you read the Encyclopedia Britannica, it says that this was initially worn from Bosnia because to tie the clothes what they wore in the cold country then became a fashion. So this is just fabrication by some of the Muslims saying that tie is a sign of cross. It has no reality, tie is not a sign of cross, it is a cultural dress, yes, worn by the Westerners. I specifically wear a suit and a tie because I want to be more comfortable with the non-Muslim. I'm a dai, so what I do, so that people should not think that I'm outdated, so I wear a suit and a tie, which is muba. You don't get any plus point for that. But at the same time, I'm wearing a cap, which is a sunnah. It's a sign of a Muslim, and I'm keeping a beard. My trousers are above the ankle. Normally you never find people wearing suits with trousers above the ankle. So I'm doing the sunnah, I'm doing the farad also, keeping a beard, wearing the trousers above the ankle, I'm wearing the sunnah, the cap. So it's a blend. And many a time, you know, it may look like a joker. Oh, who's the joker looking person wearing a suit and a tie and a kofia and a, and a topi and a cap? So it, many a times people start, okay, let's listen to this person. So this is one of the ways to to break the barriers, to open the doors for dawa. Oh, why are you wearing the cap? It's a way. So I wear it because I'm a dai. I personally don't like wearing a suit and a tie. So when you see me at home, I wear kurta pajama. When I go out, I wear pant and shirt. Most of the time when I wear suit, it's mainly for dawa purpose. If I'm giving a lecture in the audience or now, now in the studio, having the question and session. So non-Muslims, when they listen to me, there is no barrier of the dressing. But otherwise, wearing a suit and a tie, it's moba. But for me, because it helps me to break the barrier and doing dawa, that is the reason I wear a suit and a tie. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Muhammad Sarim from India. 
is dowry system allowed in Islam or only mahar is allowed in Islam? My family and especially in India, it is followed by Muslims. As far as dowry is concerned, dowry means a woman, when she gets married, she gives some wealth or money or gifts which has become a system mainly in India and now present in other parts of the world also that the woman to get married gives a lot of wealth and gifts to the husband or the family of the husband so that they accept her. This is called as dowry. In Islam, demanding dowry directly or indirectly is haram. Islam believes in the system of mahr and Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 4 that gift to the woman in marriage a gift that's a marital gift maher so giving maher is compulsory the maher can be small maher can be big depending upon the level and the facility and the wealth of the of the of the boy depending upon the status and the would be wife can demand what she wants and if the boy cannot afford he'll say i cannot afford so if the woman wants to make it less, depend. So there is no limit. She can even ask for a verse of the Quran as Maher. She can ask a mountain of gold. No one can stop her. But whether the husband agrees or not, so a Maher is compulsory as the Quran says that for a marriage to solemnize, the would-be husband should give Maher or stipulate a Maher. He can say, I am giving full now a part now, part later, or complete later, that's permitted. But the amount what's giving should be stipulated during, during the Nikanama. But demanding dowry, dowry is common in India and it's become like, you know, it's okay, suppose you're marrying a graduate, then you may have to give 2 lakh rupees as dowry. Or if you're marrying an engineer, then maybe 10 lakh rupees. If you're marrying a doctor, maybe 20 lakh rupees. You know, as they are selling herds and, you know, herds and cattle in the market field. This is totally prohibited. You cannot give indication that my son would like to travel in a Mercedes car, indicating you want a Mercedes car for dowry. You cannot say my son would like to live in a three-bedroom apartment, trying to give indication to the girl's family that you want a three-bedroom apartment as a dowry. This is prohibited. If willingly, if the parents of the girl want to give some gifts, it's permitted. But demanding dowry, directly or indirectly, from the girl or from the family of the girl is prohibited in Islam. In fact, it's the opposite. It is the husband, the would-be husband, gives a marital gift to the girl and once she receives it, she can demand a particular amount. If you can afford, fine. If you cannot afford, either, either she accepts a lower one or she goes and finds someone else who gives that amount. And once she gets that amount, it's her property. She can give it to a parent. She can invest. It is not the property of the husband. She can do what she wants with it. And Mahar is compulsory in Islam and dowry is prohibited. Asking from the woman is completely prohibited. Hope that answers the question. Next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is, I will not take the name. I am a revert. This is the Hindu revert asking the question on WhatsApp. Therefore, I didn't take a name. I am a revert. I was born and raised in Delhi, India. I took my Shahada myself last year in the month of December and I have been researching about Islam since July last year. That means she's studying for more than six months, Alhamdulillah. I am reading and understanding, trying to get better every day. I started my journey with your videos. They are amazing and it explains everything in such a beautiful manner. Jazakallah khair. It is important that I have to contact you and disturb you. Please, if you could help me in this matter. I have been trying to get my official Shahada certificate in Delhi, but nobody is providing that. Not just Delhi, but some other states as well. They simply said, they can't take any risk. I guess everyone is really scared. And this is the first step to start your process for religion change. I don't understand how this can happen. 
it is so demotivating and devastating and devastating is there any possibility you could help me get my shahada certificate that would be of great help my email id is xyz ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu i bear witness that there is no god but allah and there is none worthy of worship but allah and muhammad peace be upon him is the messenger of allah i can say this billions of times till my last breath may allah bless you always for all the work you have been doing this hindu sister has asked a very important help and she said that she herself gave the shahada last month she has been researching about islam since july 2023 for the last 6 months and she started with my videos and the videos were very helpful very logical and then she gave the shahada in december maybe after 5 months about a one one month before and when she tried for the last one month trying to get the certificate because you know if you give shahada you want to change your name and you want to let the people come to know you are a muslim but unfortunately all the muslim that she approached in delhi they were reluctant she tried in other states outside delhi they were reluctant most of them said that they cannot take the risk and she saying it is very demotivating it is devastating that this is the first step that she wants to accept islam and no one is helping her so she asked me whether i can help her or not before we come to the reply let me tell you sister sister please don't get demotivated and this is a test from allah subhanahu wa taala first i'd like to congratulate you it was great on your part that you have done self research and you have been studying about islam from the social media and for the last 6 month you have been searching about islam and one month ago in december you gave the shahada and you said the shahada on your own let me tell you very clearly if you have given the shahada on your own and you agree there's no god but allah and prophet muhammad is the messenger you are already a muslim you don't require any certificate to be a muslim it is between you and allah so let me tell you that what you have done is the best alhamdulillah may allah reward you may allah forgive all your sins may allah grant you the best in this world and the akhirah and may allah grant you jannah the firdaus reading your your message on the whatsapp really but she was to me and it's a very important point that you have mentioned that all the people you approached they were scared and they said that we can't take the risk let me give the background sister that you may be aware that in the last couple of years this government of india the bjp has arrested many of the duats and we know cases of maulana kalim siddiqui mashallah he is very active in the field and because of him there are hundreds and thousands of non muslims have accepted islam and they arrested him more than 2 years back and by the grace of allah subhanahu wa taala a few months earlier he was released i think he was in a jail for a little less than 2 years may allah reward him allah give him the best in this one and the akhira he was active in the field of dawa and through his efforts allah gave that to many non muslim and there were the muslim there were dai also so what this new government though it's mentioned in the constitution of india that every citizen of india has the right to preach practice and propagate his religion no one can stop him they were not breaking any law but they were arrested or oh, they are doing forced conversion they are forcing people to accept islam and they are bringing economic pressure they are bringing physical pressure all false allegations were made and they arrested them so because of that many of the muslims are scared so sister you should know the background and i would like to give my advice to the muslims of india that we know that since the time the bjp has come to power maybe for the last about 10 years in 2014 more than 9 and a half years over with the next few months it will be 10 years since bjp is in power and since we have the prime minister narendra modi and since he has come to power 
he has created a fierce psychosis amongst the Muslims. And the first couple of years, he was just making his house correct. And amongst his initial targets was myself. And you know, in 2016, he fabricated, you know, there was an attack done in Bangladesh. And there were some more than 20 foreigners who were killed by some Muslims. And one of the terrorists was a fan of mine on the Facebook. So they took it out of proportions. One of the newspapers said that one of the terrorists was a fan of Dr. Zakin. Like, so most of the Indian newspapers started changing the news that, oh, Dr. Zakin has inspired him to become a terrorist. And the newspaper clarified that we never said Zakir inspired, we only said that one of the terrorists was a follower of Dr. Zakir on the Facebook. And they ran a campaign and because of which I had to do Hijra. And most of you may be aware that I migrated from Bombay to Malaysia. So what our Prime Minister is doing, trying to create a fear psychosis, targeting Muslims so that the Muslims stop doing Dawah and they stop predicting propagating the deen, stop practicing the deen. In many of the states, he's saying wearing hijab is not permitted, and you know it. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that me, he support the Muslims of India. But let me give a message to the Muslims of India, that this life is a test for the hereafter. And we have in the example of the Prophet, what he did. So please, you fail to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. And we should not be scared. Yes, we should take precautions, but our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that trust in God, tie your camel, but trust in God. So trust in God, but tie your camel. And I always say, tie your camel, but don't strangle your camel. Tie it, but don't tie it so hard on the neck that you kill the camel. So we have to take precautions while doing dawa, but don't get scared. You fail to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. Yes, our Prime Minister has the machinery of the government, has the police of the government, has the court of the government. They are using all their resources to subjugate the Muslims, to traumatize the Muslims, to cause distress to the Muslims, creating a fear psychosis. On the social media you find the Muslims are being harassed. But we as Muslims, we fail to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best to protect. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 160, If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We fail to realize that the best to support is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know from the history of the Prophet that I never imagined in my wildest dream that I would be accused of promoting terrorism. I have attended in different parts of the world in various countries, I have given talks to the heads of the police, of you know the DIGs. Even in India, many a times I went to Hyderabad, the, the police police academy, and give talks to hundreds of high-ranking officials. Many times, you know, talking about anti-terrorism, etc. And then I am accused of supporting terrorism, and we take the example of a prophet that you know he did hijra so i was forced to do hijra from india to malaysia and but i did not stop my dawah i continued the dawah i could have said that you know i've been doing dawah for about 30 years starting 1987 till 2016 and now i better you know keep quiet so that my life is very peaceful etc it gave me more energy to strive harder and however much Modi tried to stop my activities, Allah helped me to flourish more. And you know that Modi in the last election, not the first election, second election, in 2019, in less than two minutes he took my name seven times. You know Jhakir, you know Jhakir, seven times. Imagine, I am blessed. The Prime Minister of the biggest democratic country that time, today it is the most populated country in the world, using my name for the vote bank. How blessed am I? Alhamdulillah. And when I did Hijra from India to Malaysia, my YouTube was only 400,000. What they did? They put a restriction on my YouTube. They blocked my YouTube. 
they forbid people to have access. Now today it is 3.8 million, mashallah. More than nine times. That time maybe there were 100,000, 200,000 Muslim Indians. Now there are more than 1 million Indians only on YouTube watching me, even after they have blocked it. <clears throat> if you go on the YouTube, Dr. Naik, you cannot go on my channel. It's blocked. So what do you have to do? You have to go through VPN. Or you change the location from India to a different country like Saudi Arabia or any other, Australia, USA, and you can have access to all my videos. So, in spite of blocking, yet there are more than a million, the maximum people on YouTube are from India. My Facebook was 14 million, now it is 23.8 million. Nearly double. So, the more they are trying to rest <laughs> cause restriction, my activity didn't stop. Alhamdulillah, my iman increased. We used to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He sacrifice our life and our wealth in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah heard half my dua that the wealth is taken away. The government has confiscated or the restriction can't use it. My life is there. We are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may our life be sacrificed. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may we be martyred in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my... <coughs> My point here is just to tell the Muslims of India, the Dais of India, that you don't have to be scared. Allah is with you. Don't be so scared that you stop doing dawah, that you stop probating your deen. Imagine a Muslim lady is coming to you that can you make a certificate and you are afraid that you will be caught by the government on the day of judgment. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you that you didn't do dawah, to the non-Muslim lady, but she's only asking help, that can you get help so that she gets a certificate and you're reluctant. I know you're scared, but who are you scared of? What is the use of living a life? You call yourself Muslims and you're afraid. Why are you, and I'm aware that most of the dais have stopped. Yes, there are a few dais which are yet boldly speaking on the television, coming on news channels. Alhamdulillah, may Allah reward them. But most of them, they have stopped. Why? If there is so much, then the Prophet says, do hijra. My life was in danger. I did hijra, but I didn't stop dawah. Now, alhamdulillah, looking at it, that more than seven years have passed, or seven and a half years have passed since we did hijra. Today, it was 2016, so about seven, seven and a half years. Now, I'm doing more dawah to Indians than what I was doing when I was in India. Yes, the peace conference that we used to have, the live dawah that has reduced, of course, that's, I no longer can go back to India, rather than be arrested. But otherwise, the dawah through the social media has increased multiple times. Imagine previously maybe 100,000 used to watch, now a million people are watching on the YouTube, 10 times more. Previously, on the Facebook was hardly about one and a half million. Today, there are nearly three million Indians. So in India alone, my dawah has increased multiple times after my hijra. And we continuously strive. We are yet conveying a message. And you know, I have thanked Modi many times. Because of Modi, I did hijra from India to Malaysia. My iman increased. My dawah activity increased. Previously, I was restricted more to comparative religion. Now I started this Ask Dr. Zakir. It has questions on fiqh also, alhamdulillah. Question answer sessions. Previously, I was more involved in giving talks only on mainly on Islam and comparative religion. Now I've gone to other fields of Islam. After doing hijra, you know, our prime minister has been following up every time with the, with the heads of states of the country where I, whether I go to Malaysia, whether I go to Qatar, whether I go to Oman, wherever I go, my prime minister is following me. Because he's following up with the heads of state, I've become closer to the heads of state, so most of these countries. So thanks to Modi that I'm doing dawah on a different level now. Not only in India, on international level it has increased. It's Hazam in Fadli Rabbi. Makhru makar Allah, wallahu khairu makirin. They planned and plotted Allah to plan. The more Modi is after me, whether in Malaysia, whether in Qatar, whether in Oman, wherever I go, he's following up and trying to you know, see to it that my dawah activity is stopped, but Allah is increasing it. 
Because of him, I am become closer to many heads of states of the Muslim countries. I have met other people. So my dawah has gone to a different level. Therefore, I said, I thank Modi. I say, Jazakallah. You know what is the meaning of Jazakallah? So many people say Jazakallah means may Allah reward him. No. Jaza means may Allah give him in return what he deserves. So Jazakallah means may Allah give him in return what he deserves. What I am actually meant to say is it is not Jazakallah Khairan. When we tell to a Muslim, we say Jazakallah Khairan means may Allah give you in return all for your good deeds. So in translation we say may Allah reward you for your good deeds. But the right translation is may Allah give you in return. Jazakallah. Khairan means may Allah give you in return for your good deeds. May Allah reward you for your good deeds. Right is may Allah give you in return for your good deeds. What I when I say Jazakallah to Modi, I am saying Jazakallah Sharan or Jaza Kalla Sharan. Because some of the Muslim scholars say that Jaza is only for reward. So it should be Jaza Kalla Sharan. Means may Allah give him in return for his evil deeds. So when I'm thanking Modi, it's because I'm blessed, my iman has increased, my dawa has increased, my closeness to Allah has increased, my ibadah has increased. So it is Jaza Kalla Sharan means may Allah give him in his return for his evil. So some scholars say jaza is only for good deeds, for otherwise it become jaza. So the pronunciation differs, the difference of opinion. So I am thanking Modi, may Allah give him in return for all his evil deeds. Whatever evil is doing in India, attacking the Muslims, he is made friends with heads of states of many Muslim countries. And many of the Muslim countries support him, unfortunately. So, yet we are continuing. We are continuing our dawah activities. We are yet coming on the satellite. Yet we are doing dawah in India. My personal dawah in India has increased multiple times because of the Prime Minister. Maybe if he wasn't there, my reach would have increased at a slow speed. Because of him, mashallah, the more you attack, you find more the people want to come to know why they are attacking. So, Again, my message to the Muslim Dais and the Muslim Organization of India, you take your precaution. You tie your camel, but don't strangulate your camel. Don't strangle your camel. Please. Because this is the test for the hereafter. You take your precaution, but don't get so scared. And I know many of the Muslims, when they were arrested by the police in India, when they come out, they do more dawah. And what did Ibn Taymiyyah, one of the, one of my great inspired Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, and you know that when he was arrested, what did he say? He said that, what can you do to me? If you arrest me, I will do ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you send me in exile, I will tafakkur. If you execute me, I will be a martyr. Paradise is in my heart. You cannot take the jannah which is in my heart. So he said, Jannah is in my heart. You cannot separate me from my Jannah. So this was his level. So we learn from these great people. Shaykh al-Islam, and he was, you know, that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that there will be a mujaddid in every century. And Shaykh al-Islam was a mujaddid of his time. And every hundred years, you will have one person who will revive Islam. So, these, these are times of testing. So let us not be afraid of what's happening. We have to strive harder. We have to take precaution. See to it that we continue our dawah. In fact, we should increase our dawah more. And Allah is with you. Allah is surely there to help you. And coming to the sister. Sister, you should not be devastated. And I really appreciate. In such time, you did your own research. And you came forward. And you said the shahada. And I like the ending part. He says, Ashhadu Allah, Ilaha Illallah, wa Ashhadu Anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah, and you bear witness that Prophet Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah. And you said you can say that a billion times till the last breath of your life. This shows your conviction. This shows that your research is very strong. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala reward you, sister. As far as you asking help from me, maybe you already received the message, 
inshallah you'll have someone who will approach you that is the reason i didn't take your name i don't want you know the agencies coming after you inshallah very sh you may already got the message i read this in the morning and maybe somebody may have contacted you inshallah very soon maybe in a few days or a couple of weeks inshallah inshallah we'll see to it that uh, that you have the certificate that you are a muslim a legal certificate from india that you are a muslim and have accepted islam again to become a muslim you don't require a certificate at the time of the prophet when the pagan arabs when they said the shahada there was no certificate you require witness so certificate is not a must but i do understand that if you want to see to it that you want to proclaim and you want to go forward and change your name etc it's good to have it so we'll see to it inshallah that in the next maybe a week or so or a couple of weeks inshallah you'll have a legal document from from delhi or from whichever city it's possible and that is the reason i didn't take your name i didn't take, i'll tell your email i don't want people trying to track down who you are and really you have you inspire people that in such a time when you know when people are after you i remember in pune when i gave a talk in pune there were more than 20 people accept islam and immediately after the talk you find police going to the house and they ask you how much dollar did dr zakir nai give you you know they're telling him how much dollar did dr zakir nai give you and believe me all 20 of them they they praised me and they said that you know we heard dr zakir nai's lecture and we have changed our life and alhamdulillah they are trying the level best to get people who can speak against me but from all the harassment etc they could not get anyone who could you know uh, testify so they are continuing their work and that gives us more encouragement that imagine the prime minister of the biggest democratic country taking my name seven times in less than two minutes i'm blessed it's from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I would not like to exchange my position with anyone else in the world. So Allah gives Izza. So I request the Muslims of India that you be strong. Allah is with you. If Allah is with you, they cannot defeat you. Maybe in this world they can cause some trouble to you. But your Akhirah has confirmed that if you are steadfast on the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if your Iman is strong and you continue helping others and propagating the deen of Islam, the more difficult the situation is, higher is the reward. I remember when we started Dawa in India, we, you know, in Bombay, one of the most difficult, most difficult places to Dawa. We, we still, we did it. Not because we were intelligent, Allah helped us and we did it. It became more and more difficult. Allah is helping us. More difficult it is, higher the reward. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our efforts. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He give that to millions of people like this lady who are done and i pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may this sister who accepted islam may she become a great dai and we pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give her the best in this world and the akhirah and ganda jarata firdaus amen Next question. Salam brother. Walaikum salam. I am getting my DNS. A DNS means deviated nasal septum. She is using short forms, but coming from medical background. I am getting my deviated nasal septum and sinuses no surgery. However, since teenage, my nose has grown a bone bump. I am getting the surgery done. Is it, permissible, is it permissible if I add nose job to correct the shape of my nose as well? Your answer will be highly regarded. As far as doing cosmetic surgery is concerned, the, the, the question has asked that can she do a nose, uh, uh, a nose job? Nose job is rhinoplasty, you know, of the nose. 
it's more of a custom more of a cosmetic surgery so she has a DNA deviated nasal septum the the bone in the nose it is deviated so the breathing may be a problem they may have various things like cold often or uh, having the upper respiratory tract infection often various reasons so while doing this can she do a nose job rhinoplasty to improve as far as the ruling is concerned of cosmetic surgery cosmetic surgery of two types one is essential cosmetic surgery because maybe she has or uh, the person has a uh, accident or a burn injury or a congenital defect maybe has an extra digit extra finger maybe two fingers are joined together so you do operation of removing the extra finger or the two fingers which are joint removing or maybe a burn injury is there you know 80 percent burn so the skin is completely gone so you have to do a plastic surgery so one type of cosmetic surgery it is essential cosmetic surgery maybe for burn injury or for an accident or a congenital defect and you improve it this is permissible and there is proof in the hadith that once one of the sahabas in the battlefield the nose was chopped off so he puts a silver nose and it becomes putrid so the prophet says put a gold nose so prophet gives permission for a gold nose so even a, a gold nose was put on the sahaba you know so that's so that's permission this is a cosmetic surgery which is essential at the same time the prophet said he prohibited the woman from plucking the eyebrows or for filing the teeth or for putting additional hair you know just to beautify themselves so the second type of surgery cosmetic surgery is for beautification that you want to look more beautiful you want to straighten your nose so that you know you look more beautiful so doing cosmetic surgery for beautification like you want to improve the shape of your face so that your jawbone looks good or you know you're adding hair to your hair or plucking eyebrows so this the prophet prohibited because they're changing what Allah has given you but if it's essential surgery cosmetic surgery because of some accident or burn injury or some congenital defect then it's permitted so in your case if you have a DNS which is the deviated nasal septum and you have sinuses that are doing a surgery and doing a rhinoplasty so that your health improves or so that it makes you function better it's perfectly all right but doing cosmetic surgery for beautifying yourself is haram but doing cosmetic surgery because it improves your health and it makes you live better or breathe better improves your sinus so that no problem is there it's perfectly fine hope that answers the question The next question. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi Me and my husband were in haram relationship before marriage. It means we loved each other and did some haram activities. But we know it is haram, felt ashamed several times. After that, he went abroad and we continued in video call. But we know it's also haram, felt ashamed, asked forgiveness from Allah, and we continued. After that, he came from abroad and married and we married each other but I could not remember that I asked forgiveness before marriage after marriage we both did Umrah Hajj and lots of good deeds Alhamdulillah we are now in the righteous path now we come to know if we forget to repent if we forgot to repent before marriage our marriage is invalid is it true we did manage 10 years before we did marriage 10 years before now we have children who are seven and four years old i'm depressed now i couldn't do anything always crying please tell me what should i do how can i remarry him in this in this practical world if we couldn't do this is it still considered unlawful relationship what about our good deeds and what we have done as husband and wife Please answer me, sir. As far as if you were in a haram relationship, if you did zina, which is gunai kabira, and later on, the, the boy and girl married each other, but before marrying, they forgot to repent. Normally, if you repent, inshallah, Allah forgives, and you marry, there's no problem. 
But if you forgot to repent before marrying, and if you married, what is the ruling? The ruling, if you forgot to repent, and you did zina with the same boy and girl did zina, you forgot to repent and you married, what is the ruling? Majority of the fuqahs, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, and Imam Shafi, they said that if you if a boy and girl do zina, and then they marry, and they don't ask for repentance, it's understood that they have repented, so the marriage is valid and the children are also lawful. But according to Ahmad ibn Hanbal, oh may Allah have mercy on him, he says that if you forget to repent, if you are in a haram relationship, if you did zina, and if you forget to repent before marrying, then the marriage is nullified. It's not valid. And he says that because the Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 3, that an adulterer can only marry an adulteress or a mushrika. And an adulteress can only marry an adulterer and a mushrika. That means a zani, a man who has committed zina, can only man marry another lady who is or a mushrik or a mushrika. Similarly, a lady who is done zina can only marry another zani or a mushrik or an idolater. And the believers, it is unlawful for the believers to marry them. So based on this, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal says that it is haram for a Muslim to marry a Zani. If the Zani repents or if the lady repents, it's fine. If they don't repent, the marriage is unlawful because Allah ends the verse by saying it is unlawful for the believers. So based on this, according to the humbly school of thought, it is haram. So what should be done? is that they should marry again. And this is the view of, of even Sheikh Muhammad Salih Taymi. And even Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, he says that from this verse of the Quran, it becomes clear that Muslims cannot marry Azani. So if they repent, Allah forgives, no problem. But if they forget to repent, the solution is that they should have another marriage. As far as the children that are there, the children will be attributed to the father. So the children can remain yours. But you are saying that now you are depressed, what should you do? So the ruling is that you prefer following the view of the humbly soul of thought. What you can do is that you can remarry with the proper wali. And you don't have to tell the world why you are remarrying. Why are you again doing the marriage? You can just say, okay, fine, maybe a first nikah, I think there was some problem, I want to do a new nikah. You don't have to describe why you are doing it. But the right ruling is so that you put your mind at rest. Do a, again nikah with the husband, even though you married 10 years back, you come to know late. You do a new nikah, get a qazi, see to it that you have a wali. Maybe the girl has a father or a brother, but a father is preferable. <coughs> and you can give excuse, maybe the first marriage wasn't done properly. I want to do a new nikah, there's no problem at all. So at least, you are fulfilling the views and no one will say doing again is not permitted. So if you are doing nikah again, it's safe that you are, you are at rest, that you are even agreeing with the view of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Allah have mercy on him. So my suggestion to you would be sister or brother who has asked the question, that you remarry and inshallah children will be yours and you ask Allah for forgiveness. Now that you ask Allah, Allah has forgiven you, remarry so that it is a valid nikah and a valid nikah with your husband and wife. And inshallah, we pray to Allah that uh, may he give you the best in this world and the akhirah. The next question. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. I want to ask if it is halal or haram for me to sell grapes to a non-Muslim of whom I know he will make alcohol out of it 
and sell it to other people for consumption. Is it allowed to sell grape to non-Muslims if I know that the non-Muslim is going to make alcohol out of that grape and sell it to others? According to Abu Hanifa, uh, 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 may Allah have mercy on him, his view is that if you are selling grapes and if you know the non-Muslim will make alcohol out of the grape, it is no problem you selling it to him. That's his ruling. As far as uh, Imam Malik the, uh, and uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, the Maliki school of thought, the Hanbali school of thought, and majority of the Shafi school of thought, they say it is prohibited. If you know that the person you're going to sell grapes to, if he's going to make alcohol from it, it is prohibited to sell it to him. There is a small minor view of the Shafi who says it is makru to sell. Permitted but makru. So if you don't sell it's better if you know that you're going to make use the grape to make alcohol. But if you sell, it is makru. But the majority of the scholars, the humbly school of thought, the Maliki school of thought, and majority of the Shafis, they say it is haram to sell grapes to someone who you know who is going to make use of it to make alcohol. And the Quranic verse is very clear in, in Surah Maida chapter 1, number 2. It says, help each other in birr and taqwa, in righteousness. But do not help one another in sin and rancor. So, the majority ruling is, is more correct. It's a more correct ruling that if you know someone is going to buy the grape from you and make alcohol, so you should not sell it to it. It's not permitted. This will be the last question we'll take as time is running short before we end the session. Niru from Switzerland, who is a student. Hello, I am interested about Islam for now four to five months. I believe in God. I wanted to know if I should wait to convert because I still have some haram habits. I live in a western country and it's hard to do everything good. Thank you for your answers. Niru, who lives in Switzerland and is a student, she has been studying about Islam for four to five months and she believes there is one God and I believe she also believes in Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him but she says she yet does something which is haram maybe she may be she hasn't mentioned but maybe she may be having pork or maybe she may not be dressed in the Islamic manner so she is asking should she wait still till she stops all the haram activity or should she accept Islam as far as a non-Muslim wanting to accept Islam minimum Two criteria are required. The non-Muslims should agree that there is no God except Allah. There is only one God, Allah. And he or she should accept that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger of this God. If these two things are confirmed, that they believe there is no God but Allah, and no one is worthy of worship except him, and Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger, I feel they should accept Islam. If you are not following, you have been studying for four to five months, mashallah. A few things you may not be doing, maybe you like pork and don't want to give it up or whatever it is. I feel these are minor issues. The main thing is shirk. If you have stopped shirk, if you worship no one else besides Allah, and you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Almighty God, I feel you should accept because if you die as a mushrik, you will not enter paradise. You will be going to hell for sure. So at least if you accept Islam and you believe in one God, you believe he alone should be worshipped and believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger, inshallah at least you go to paradise. The other thing inshallah you can work on it and once you accept Islam, there are more chances you stop the haram activity than not accepting Islam. If you don't accept Islam, okay fine, maybe I'll have alcohol for another five months or six months or maybe I'll wear these dresses for another one year. Once you accept Islam, maybe your conscience will bite and and today, the, the percentage of may be small, but yet there are many Muslims of alcohol who may be doing haram activities. That doesn't mean they gave up Islam. As long as you agree it is haram. If you agree it is haram, but you cannot stop it, you are yet a Muslim, it's not kufr. Yes, it's haram. So my advice to you is that accept Islam as soon as possible. 
don't delay, you don't know how long you're going to live. And inshallah, once you accept Islam, you start praying and Allah will help you. And inshallah, you see to it that Allah will take away all the haram activities from your life. And this is all that we could answer. And till we meet again after two weeks, today is the 6th, inshallah we'll meet again on the 20th of January. Till we meet them, I would like to say, Assalamu alaikum, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, wa akhiru dawan, alhamdulillah.